welcome everyone to Code Astro, both remote and in person. This is, I think, the first year we're having it in person. In addition, so we we've, we've had this for two or two years now, hybrid, so uh, in remote. So it's gonna we're gonna be learning how to do this hybrid mode as we go. But uh, yeah, we're excited to have everyone here. Sarah, you want to take it away with the welcome slides? Yeah. Um, hey all. Uh, so. I was I meant to be there in person today, but I woke up feeling pretty crappy yesterday, so I figured I'd save you from that. Um, but that is, I guess, one of the great things about having a hybrid workshop. Um, so we've got a bunch of welcome slides here to sort of set the tone for the workshop and try to preemptively answer some questions that you have. Um, I'll get into like how to ask questions. Uh, let me just move Discord, hold on. Sorry. Um, but if you have questions, uh, all of the, the TAs will be monitoring the chat and Discord and Piazza throughout the presentation, so feel free to use them at any time. Okay, so first off, why does this workshop exist? Um, most astronomers, including many of us who are teaching and TAing this workshop, have no formal education in programming, and this is bad for uh, astronomy. It causes bugs in code poorly documented or hard to read code or code that isn't reproducible or inefficient. But more importantly, it makes us feel really bad. Um, one of the hardest things about uh, teaching this workshop is that every year people email me and Jason and Matt and everyone else like telling us how sorry they are and how nervous they are and they think that they're not as good as everyone else at code. There's this like notion throughout astronomy that like we should be better at programming and we're failures because we're not um so this isn't to you know make you great at coding so that you can get rid of that notion it's to sort of connect you with a group of people that all want to write really good code and that can all support you in feeling good about writing good code um so luckily you don't need to major in computer science to learn to write good code um, you don't need formal education, aside from this workshop. <laughs> um, this workshop is going to teach you the habits of excellent software developers, or at least we hope it will. So th these are the overarching goals for the workshop. Um, by the end of the workshop, you'll be able to use the language of software development, develop and release an open source astronomy package from start to finish, and write code that follows best practices of software development. So this year we made a workshop cheat sheet that I also plugged on Piazza. Um, and this, this has like all the links that you need for the workshop, basically. So you can access it just by clicking on this link here. I'll also show you how to get there from Googling it. So it has the code of conduct, the website, the GitHub, calendar, like everything you could possibly need. So all of the resources that I'm about to reference on the next couple slides, they're all linked back here. Um, you can also get to it by Google, just if you Google code astro um, GitHub, it's the first thing that comes up. And then if you scroll down here, it's the workshop info. So that's also how to get there if you don't uh, remember this particular slide. Okay. Um, so one of my favorite things about that we have from the workshop is this class and TA source vocabulary list. Uh, so we keep track of relevant vocabulary here. I'll click on it so you can see. Um, feel free to bookmark and also add or request uh, definitions to be added. So uh, these are all filled out from previous years, so we've already got a lot. Um, but of course, it's a living document and uh, you should have comment privileges. Um, so feel free to request or add additional things to it. I'll also remind you about this once a day so you don't forget. <laughs> okay, so some logistics. Uh, the classes are going to be hybrid over Zoom and in person. Um, this is the first year that we're doing hybrid. We've done only uh, remote in past years, like Jason said. Uh, so I'm sure there will be a bit of a learning curve, but we'll figure it out. Um, Feel free to like, please let us know if you can't hear something or if something's going wrong, um, we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, C 
seems like most of you got into this Zoom room. Um, it'll be the same one throughout the workshop, um, and it's password protected to prevent Zoom bombing. Um, mute when you're not speaking, um, and video is optional. Um, it's it's nice for the presenters if you have video on because we get some like sort of feedback, but it's totally fine if you want to keep your video off. Um, we're also going to record and distribute the classes afterward. Um, so uh, yeah, if you miss something or you just want to go back, totally fine. Uh, the typical schedule in the Pacific time zone is from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We're going to do Zoom lectures and interactive exercises. So that's starting now and going for three hours. Um, and then the rest of the workshop um, is for you. It's unstructured time for you to finish in-class exercises, work through uh, Jupyter Notebooks more carefully, and also work on your group project. Um, you can spend, you don't have to spend, you know, the four hours immediately after the workshop is over uh, on this time. Um, whenever, whatever time works for you is totally fine. Uh, coordinate with your group members to make, to pick good times throughout the week. Uh, we've designed this class to take 40 hours of your time, so um, half of the time will be in the lectures and then the other half of the time will be this unstructured time for you to um, work through things on your own and work on your group project. The group project will take about, should take about 10 hours, uh, so about half of that unstructured time can be just for you and half of that can be for your group project. So we're often going to put you, <coughs> excuse me, we're often going to put you into breakout rooms to work on activities in small groups. Um, you're going to be working with your project groups throughout the week. So every time I say like go into your breakout rooms, um, you'll go into the same room with your project members. Um, we're going to open up uh, breakout rooms with numbers. Uh, so you just join the number of the breakout room that is your group. Um, if you are, if you don't want to be with um, one of your group members for any reason, maybe you don't work well together, or you just work well all the time, work with them all the time, like just let us know um, and we'll keep this option open throughout the workshop and we can shuffle around groups if you'd like. Okay, in-person logistics. Um, right now you're here um, in Keith Spaulding 410. Uh, after lunch, we've reserved a, a block of rooms in Lind, which is across the street here. Um, there are a bunch of on-campus lunch spots that I've lunch spots that I've linked here that you can refer back to. Um, there's also a bunch of good off-campus stuff um, on Lake Avenue. Feel free to go explore. Um, if you're getting a per diem from us for food, meaning we're we're financially covering your your food, um, you can you can go anywhere. You'll just get a flat rate for reimbursement. Um, so you don't have to go to on-campus lunch spots if you don't want to. Uh, so for remote folks, um, you can uh, use the chat here at the bottom if you want to ask a question. Um, also, if you go into a breakout room, there's this ask for help button. Um, so feel free to use that to ask a TA or someone else to come help you out. All right, so now Discord. Um, if you haven't logged into, if you haven't been able to log into Discord, send us an email. Um, but if you have, uh, open up Discord right now and change your nickname on Discord to your real name, and you can optionally add your pronouns. This will just make it easier for other folks to find you. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. If I go to Discord. Um, I can do this. Oops. Of course, I shouldn't have done this in real time. It's on the side here, right? <laughs> um, I forget how to do this. Just kidding. The live demo strikes again. What? The live demo strikes again. Oh. Yep. Top left, the drop number, it says code Astro on the top left. Mm -hmm. And then you put uh, edit server profile. Sweet. Do it there. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. So that's how you do it. <laughs> I knew all along. I was just testing you. <laughs> okay. 
Um, another resource I want to plug for you is this anonymous feedback form, um, which you can fill out as often as you want. Um, ideally, we'd love a continuous stream of feedback on the workshop. Um, feel free to fill it out once a day if you'd like. You can fill it out if something goes really well or if something goes really badly. Um, yeah, we'll also have a, a more uh, like ask you more specific questions in a longer feedback form at the end of the workshop. Um, so if you'd like, you can wait till that as well. Um, but we, we do use this to make uh, modifications to the workshop in real time throughout the week. Uh, so yeah, definitely use this often. Okay, um, these are the website and schedule. Um, we, if you, uh, this is what the website looks like. Um, we've got some logistical details for in-person stuff here. Um, and a list of all of the teaching assistants and TAs um, and all of the topics that we'll cover on individual days. Um, the GitHub is where uh, the course materials live. Uh, there's a readme in each day's folder with project goals and lecture materials for the day. So this is what the GitHub looks like. Um, if we go to day one, for example, um, here's the project goals for today. Here's the learning objective specifically for today and a bunch of useful links specifically for today. Um, and in the workshop info cheat sheet, it also links to the homepage, uh, the readme for each individual day. So you can go back to that. Um, the, I forgot to update this. The recorded lectures are actually going to be public this year, so they'll be uploaded to YouTube. So we'll send out that link um, as soon as it's ready as well. Okay, uh, so project logistics. So I think one of the most exciting things for many of you is the idea that by the end of this week, you're going to hopefully have developed and released a fully documented, well-tested, and open source Python package. Um, so you're going to work with one or three others, one to three others on this project. Um, so we suggest that you use some of the unstructured time today to brainstorm and decide on an idea and start writing some preliminary code for your package. Um, at the end of the week, we have an optional additional day on Saturday where you'll be able to uh, try out each other's packages. You'll be able to install each other's packages and actually try and run through it. Um, so we've got uh, there's a more detailed write up of the project in uh, that's linked in the workshop cheat sheet file. Um, but some quick ideas here are you could make an automatic CV maker, you could do something related to your research, um, you could do visualization software, uh, process an image, these sorts of things are totally fine. We've had really awesome projects in the past and I've linked a couple of the past ones um, in the project description file. So you're going to be doing a lot of group work uh, in Code Astro. I know group work is sort of a, a scary thing. <laughs> um, so we want to give you some guidelines for how to group work, especially for how to code in group work. Uh, so we're using a paradigm called pair programming. In pair programming, one person is the driver who types code, and the other person is the navigator who sort of watches what gets typed and offers directions. So the driver's thinking more about having the right syntax, making sure that all the smaller details are correct. Navigator's thinking more big picture about how the code should work or function. And you should be switching back and forth pretty constantly, especially towards the beginning. Um, we recommend that you set a timer for 10 minutes, for example, and switch after 10 minutes. Um, you can also break it up by task. So if you want to someone types one function and then another person types another function it's really fine um you can have if you have more than two people in a group then two people are navigators and just rotate and share your screen as you're doing this if you're working over over um if you're working virtually uh so for today and tomorrow in particular we're suggesting that you do as much pair programming as possible when starting off designing your package because designing is is very collaborative um, at this point, I always like to say that uh, when, so Jason and I uh, designed Orbitize together and we did it using pair programming. Um, so we, we were at a AAS hack hackathon together and we just sat and pair programmed and designed Orbitize. 
So totally reasonable to, to do this. <laughs> it's possible, <laughs> especially when you're working with people you like. <laughs> um, and later in the program, we're going to talk to you about Git branches um, and we'll give you some more tools to sort of start working on things in parallel more individually. Uh, so it's totally okay to start working on stuff individually later in the week, but for now, do a lot of pair programming. Uh, for breakout rooms, uh, so this is not necessarily when you're working on uh, your package or your project, but when you're uh, just working on like activities that are relevant to the lessons, um, we suggest assigning roles for each participant. Uh, we'll try to remember to remind you to do this as well. Um, it's also totally fine to take the first 10 or 15% of the time to just think on your own. You don't need to rush into discussing as a group right away. Okay, my favorite slide, how to ask questions. First of all, often, we want you to ask as many questions as humanly possible. Um, you can use the chat box. Um, I might do, uh, I'll actually use Piazza for this this year, but I'll do something called chat box flood, where I'll ask a question um, during the lecture and I'll ask you to all respond at the same time. So I'm gonna be doing that in Piazza. Um, just because of the number of people that are here, we prefer that you don't unmute during the class. Um, so if you have a question, let us know in the chat and use the or use the raise hand feature on Zoom. If you're in person, uh, feel free to raise your physical hand <laughs> um, and then you can come up to the front and ask your question. Uh, Piazza is one of my favorite places to ask questions. Uh, Piazza is searchable, so other participants can see your question and see how it was resolved. There's also an anonymous option on Piazza. So if you if you want to be anonymous asking your question, Piazza is a good place for that. Um, also feel free to ask questions on Discord. Uh, Discord is also the way that we suggest you communicate with your fellow participants. And there will be, uh, your TAs will, will reach out, the, the TA that's assigned to, uh, to help you out with your project will uh, reach out in a private channel for your group. So all of these, uh, all of these media, mediums, media will be monitored uh, during, before, and after lectures. So hopefully we'll answer all your questions uh, in a timely manner. Okay, time expectations. I touched on this a little bit already. Um, you don't need to attend lectures when they occur. Um, obviously it's, it's preferable if you can. I think you, you get more out of it that way, but it's totally fine if you can't. Um, so we're gonna send the recorded lectures to everyone after. Um, we're, there are office hours scheduled throughout the week for you to ask questions. Um, throughout most, basically throughout most of time, <laughs> um, there should be in the, next, uh, in the next week, there should be a TA or two um, on, on Discord uh, available to ask questions, for you to ask questions. Um, we're scheduling some office hours during like off hours in Pacific time zone. So if you're working or parenting or if you're in a different time zone, you can still participate. Um, and as I said before, we've designed this course to take 40 hours of your time. So one week working full time. Uh, that doesn't mean you will finish every single thing we assign to you in 40 hours. It means you should aim to take 40 hours of your time to work on this. Um, it's, it's completely fine to you know, save some of it for later. Um, this is it's also the sort of situation where like, we're giving you a lot of information and you can sort of dig down arbitrarily deep into it. Um, so, you know, you will not learn everything possible to learn in 40 hours. Um, but yeah, to have that number in your mind for how much time uh, we think that you should spend on the workshop. Um, also discuss time and time expectations with your project group members uh, so that you all make sure you're on the same page with like how much time you want to spend uh, when you want to meet that kind of stuff. Okay, um, so I'm about to show you the code of conduct and uh, before I show the code of conduct, I wanted to sort of motivate the code of conduct a little bit. Um, and I also wanted to just highlight sort of the, the beautiful like diversity of people that are in the room right now. 
Um, we've had people participate in Code Astro from every continent except Antarctica, which is pretty cool. Got to have someone from Antarctica at some point so we can say every continent. <laughs> um, so there are people in the Zoom or room right now who could teach this class. There are people who have no experience with anything we're going over and are already overwhelmed. There are people in between these experience levels, people of different genders, ethnicities, races, and sexualities, people from different socioeconomic classes, people from different nations, people with disabilities, and people who are stressed about something other than the workshop. Um, everyone's welcome here. You all belong here. Um, everyone also has different goals and priorities for the workshop, and everyone's going to get something different out of the workshop, and that's all okay. Okay, so since we have uh, so many different people here, uh, we're enacting a, a code of conduct to sort of strive to create an inclusive and positive environment. Um, so I, I'm not going to read this word for word, but I want to sort of point out some relevant things from it. Um, so first, we're, we're dedicated to providing a welcoming and supportive environment for everyone. Um, but we will fail at this. It's not gonna, it, it, we're not, we can't just say that and have it be true. Um, there are people who, that are here that are, uh, sub, that are part of groups that are subject to historical and ongoing discrimination. Um, so we want to uh, sort of get ahead of harassment of any kind. Um, so, uh, we listed some, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, harassment is prohibited regardless of intent. So even if you didn't mean to harass someone or didn't mean to, um, to hurt someone, uh, it's still, it's still prohibited. So we've given some examples of sort of, uh, very bad prohibited harassing behavior at this link here. And then I also wanted to uh, encourage everyone to adhere to the following principles. So we want to treat others with respect, recognize the humanity of people with different backgrounds, life experiences, and preparation levels than themselves, acknowledge your own contributions and agree to share your work, recognize and celebrate the contributions of others, create a culture of giving and receiving constructive feedback, committing to a mission of supporting equity, diversity, and inclusion in science, and be conscious of your contributions to group conversations. Uh, talkative folks should be careful not to talk over others. And also don't use curse words or make even potentially offensive jokes. I also just want to thank everyone here for helping to make this a welcoming and friendly community for all. I really love the Code Astro community, and I know that you all will do a great job uh, upholding this code of conduct and, and becoming a part of it. Um, I also just want to plug the anonymous feedback form again on this slide. Um, if, uh, if you want to tell us something, um, if you think that if you're feeling, if you're feeling like you're being harassed or you feel uncomfortable about something, or even if you just want to talk to someone about something, uh, feel free to fill this out or contact us directly. Um, we're also going to enact the following social rules. Um, so. Uh, you can read through these in more detail, but I want to just uh, go over them very briefly. So the first one is no well actuallys. Uh, so here's an example. It's actually called something else. Um, no feign surprise. Uh, what's the command line? Oh my god, you've never used the command line before? No backseat driving. Um, here's the example. And then no subtle isms. So feel free to read through these in more in more detail. I just wanted to sort of make everyone aware and give these examples. Okay, almost done. <laughs> um, want to uh, stop talking for a second and let the other instructors introduce themselves. So, well. Before I stop talking, I'll introduce my own self. <laughs> um, so my name's Sarah, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a PhD candidate at Caltech in astronomy. I'll hand it over to Jason. 
Oh, so all the in-person instructor TAs are going to come up, just like come, or well, call you up and just say say hi to the camera, basically. Uh, so hi, I'm I'm Jason. I'm a, currently a postdoc at Caltech, a rising assistant professor at Northwestern. Um, yeah, excited to be at this workshop. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Posick. Uh, pronouns he, him, his. Uh, I'm a postdoc at UCLA. Um, and uh, I'm remote, I'm hybrid, so I'm going to be remote some of the days, I'm going to be in person some of the days, so you'll, so both groups will, will see me a bit here. So looking forward to working with everyone. Thanks, Matt. All right, geez. Pranav, you want to go first? Mm, maybe he's not on. Okay. Uh, Paulina? Hi, uh, I am Paulina. Uh, I will be teacher assistant this year remote and I'm doing my PhD in Nice in France. So nice to meet you all. Thanks. Simon? Um, yeah. Yes. Hi. Am I speaking into the camera? <laughs> yeah, just speak into the camera. Uh, here, let me turn this back on so you can see what you're doing. So you're right there. Oh, hey. Hi, I'm Simon. Um, pronouns are he, him, his. I work currently right now as a senior site reliability engineer at Roblox. Um, yeah, excited to work with you guys here. I'm also now noticing I'm wearing the same shirt as my photo. <laughs> <laughs> Chatan, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chetan and I'm attending this and being a TA from India. I attended Code Astro last year as well. My pronouns are he, him. I am currently doing a data analysis job at ZS and I am also working at ASIAA as a research intern in astronomy. Awesome, thanks. All right, uh, Shu. We can come back. Uh, Vignesh is in person as well. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Vignesh. I'm a third year, well, rising third year at Berkeley, also a Code Astro alum. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his. I hope to have a good week with y'all. It's, it's a fun workshop. Go Bears. <laughs> cool. Jaya? Hi everyone. <clears throat> Hi everyone. <laughs> I'm Jaya. I'm a rising second year uh, grad student at Harvard. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I did Code Astro in 2019. So yeah, um, I think that's it. Thanks. Uh, Siddharth? Hi, my name is Siddharth. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm master student at Indian Institute of Science. And this is my second year as a TA. Hope you guys have fun to speak. Awesome, thanks. All right, Yash. Uh, hi, I hope I'm audible. So my name is Yash Mehta. I go with uh, the pronouns he and he or him. And uh, I am not an undergrad at ISA, forgot to make that correct correction. I am Hi. actually just finishing my master's at ISA. And I look forward to meeting you all and uh, working with you. Awesome. Kirti? Any more in person ones? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kirti. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I did my undergrad in IIC, but now I'm doing my master's in Netherlands. So you all the way from there. And two years ago, I was a participant and last year I was a TA. So nice meeting you all. Awesome. Uh, Suchi? Hi everyone, I'm Suchi. I am uh, she, her, and... <laughs> Um, I'm going to be a third year grad student at the University of Hawaii um, Institute for Astronomy. And I did Code Astro last year, so I'm excited to be a TA here in person. 
Sweet, thanks. Sama? Hello everyone, uh, I'm Sameh. Uh, I came from Germany. I'm doing my PhD there at the University, second year. All right, and last but not least, round of tears, David? Hi, I'm David, uh, pronounced he him. I'm a PhD candidate at LJMU in Liverpool, and I was a participant on Code Astro last year. Awesome, uh, Belinda? Hey everyone, my name is Belinda. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I am remote today, but I'm gonna be in person uh, the rest of the week. Um, so I'm excited to see you all then. Um, and the rest of you, I'll see you online. Um, I'm a student at Pasadena City College, um, working my way toward applying to uh, grad school in planetary science. Oh, and I was a participant last year. <laughs> Awesome. Briley? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Briley. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a fourth going on fifth year PhD student at UCLA. Um, and I'm remote because West LA might as well be a different state compared to Pasadena. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so I'm not making that drive again after double AS last week. Um, and I work on planetary science and I was a, a code astro student last year. So I'm excited to be a TA this year. Yoni, last but not least. Oh, in the back. Yeah. Cool school. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Yoni. I'm a, my parents are he, him. I'm a third year at the University of Kansas. Um, I was a Code Astro participant last year, and it was so fun that I wanted to TA. Sweet. All right. So uh, now we're going to give you a chance to talk a little bit. Um, so I'm going to make some breakout rooms. Uh, as a reminder, please join the room that corresponds to your project number, the project group number. Uh, so introduce yourself, your name, your career level, your research area, and then answer two questions. First, how do you feel about coding? And second, what are your goals for this workshop? Okay. I think most folks are back. Uh, so let's finish up. Uh, so. Uh, before I uh, turn it over to Jason for your first official Code Astro lesson, uh, I want to tell you about the specific goals for today. Uh, so the the goals. For... Give, give, give us one sec. Oh, one sorry, sec. sorry. All right, guys. Yes. Okay, we're we're good. Sorry, I was muted. No worries. Um, okay, so the goals for the workshop today specifically are to. Identify which development environment is most appropriate uh, for your programming task. Decide when and how to design software using functional and object-oriented paradigms. Employ best practices for using NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and AstroPy in open source packages and explain the purposes, purposes of each of these. Totally fine if you don't know what any of those words mean yet. Um, that's what today's for. <laughs> Um, and the project goal today is to decide on the purpose of your package and write one central function or class. Um, and the very last slide is we want you to make sure you have the latest version of the Code Astro repository. We're going to be making uh, updates and changes to it throughout the week. Um, so uh, we're going to ask you at the beginning of every lesson to run this set of commands. So CD to your wherever you put the Code Astro directory when you get cloned it and run git pull and then git checkout main. Alrighty. Okay, Jason, over to you. Okay, great. I do not want to leave site. Um, all right, shall we get back started? Um, so the first, um, we can, uh, people in Zoom can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Awesome, thanks. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about today is software development environments. So this is um, where what program to use to write your programs. So it's the, the meta, the most meta thing to start out with. Um, so we're gonna cover kind of three different types of software development environments uh, in the beginning. Um, a lot of this is personal preference and some of these things are somewhat opinions. So um, take it with what, uh, what you want and you know, find what works for you and 
uh, each person's workflow is a bit different than everyone else's. We just want to show you some options and you can decide, you know, what, what works out best for you. So we're going to cover three different kinds. One is the integrated development environment or IDEs. Uh, second are Jupyter notebooks and the last are just plain text editors. All right, so first IDE, so uh, you might have heard these before, integrated development environments, they sound very fancy. Um, they're basically all-in-one programs that let you, that come with many features to help you code. Um, we, uh, it, one of the downsides of IDEs is that there's a lot of features and sometimes there is a learning curve to use one of these programs, um, but we think it's worth the small amount of effort to like invest in it early on, just to like learn how to use them and they'll, it'll help you in future, in the future basically. So. Um, two of the leading IDEs for Python development are uh, VS Code and PyCharm. Um, so you might have heard some of these terms before. Uh, we're going to be using demoing features of VS Code throughout this workshop and showing you how to use it. Uh, but there's equivalent features in PyCharm and other IDEs available uh, online. Both of these are free. Um, you can just download them off the internet. They work on all operating systems, so it's very nice. Um, yeah, so let me just do a quick demonstration of uh, VS Code. I'll just show you some basic features for now. Um, so here's my VS Code development environment for Code Astro. Uh, so typically with these IDEs, uh, you, uh, you generally open up a project folder. So I go to File, Open Folder, and I select my Code Astro folder. Um, basically, then I, I go to the File Explorer here on the right-hand side. I have the entire Code Astro. Uh, I see I was working on it. Um, I have basically the entire Code Astro GitHub repo cloned here. Uh, and I can access basically any of the files and the subfolders and work on any particular file. Uh, uh, in addition to this like folder directory view, um, I also have, this is the, this is like the text view. This is where I actually do my coding. So I can, I can like, type here. Um, and also generally uh, you'll see that uh, you can also uh, terminal, you can also have an integrated terminal in your program. So basically everything you, basically want to have is here, you'd have your development, you have your, your directories on the side where you can access all your files, you have your main part where you're actually coding, and you have your terminal integrated into, uh, into your development environment. So here's just like a standard bash terminal. So, you know, I can do OS and things like that and just run commands as I want. Um, let's see, uh, sorry, I'm a, uh, where did my lecture notes go? Um, right, okay, so one of the nice things about IDEs over a lot of other standard text editors, well, I mean, Jupyter Notebook has this also to some extent, is your ability to kind of, uh, it makes, add some features to make codes, uh, make code, like, right, uh, your coding experience a bit nicer. So if I go to, like, day one, and I can create, you know, a new folder, a new, I can create a new file, we call it, like, demo.py, I can start out this file and start typing things like I want to do an import statement in Python. I can type import, and you can see that the autocompletes basically give me all the options I can ever type, a lot of which I would never use. Uh, but I can use, like, say, something like import numpy as np. Um, I can uh, you know, define a variable equals to numpy.array. Uh, and one of the nice things is, you know, once I create a function, it basically will, these tooltips will uh, appear, like, I, I can hover over the array function and the entire doc string. So like if you went to the NumPy website for the documentation for um, a NumPy array, that, that basically appears as a tooltip um, over here. So instead of having to switch to a web page, I can basically read off, you know, oh, here's how the function is supposed to be called. Here's what the parameters mean. Uh, you know, here's at the bottom, you know, some examples for how to call this function. So it gives you uh, basically uh, what you could access on a, on a website basically integrated into your coding experience. So this is especially nice for it's like dealing with like NumPy functions or like AstroPy functions, something like you use occasionally, you kind of know what it does, but you're not exactly sure of the details. It kind of gives you the hints to basically help you figure these things out. Um, and it says I can like, you know, set an array, you go to three. Uh, and also an another nice thing is like, if I, you know, try to do something like sum equals the sum of array, but maybe I like, I'm really bad at spelling and I just like mistype it. Um, you, you know, you get your like Microsoft Word level, like little squigglies that appear under underneath like a uh, thing that you mistypes. So it basically does what's called static error checking. And this basically, it looks through the code and be like, be like, hum, you're using this variable, but you've never defined it anywhere. So this is probably some, you probably made a mistake somewhere. So if you hover over this, it basically tells you like, oh, arg is not defined. And you 
you can basically, you know, instead of writing the code and your code crashing, it basically tells you while you're coding that there's basically some issue here. So, um, so this is actually quite nice because a lot of code, you know, a lot of issues run through just like typos and things like that. It basically does a lot of this stuff for you. And uh, it, it does take a little bit of time just to get used to. You can see like I, I did it pretty fast because I'm kind of used to this environment. But like at first you might have to get used to this workflow. But if you learn it, I think it does help with like uh, coding smoothly and also uh, reducing the number of bugs in your code. Cool. Um, yeah, so like I said, there is a terminal here. So you can basically... If I save this, I can you know run it directly from the terminal down here at the bottom. So if I cd into a one, I can run python demo.py and it's gonna crash because I obviously did not fix the typo. Um, but I you know I can also uh, I can also run it from many. There's also mul multiple ways to run this. I can also there's a play button up here in the top right corner. I can hit this and it'll, it'll basically do the equivalent. It's also gonna run that piece of code. Um, and the nice thing, which we're going to discuss a lot more tomorrow, which really I think is one of the nice things about IDEs and why I use them to develop Python packages, especially complicated ones, is we have a debug mode. So here I can run the code a third time, but with debugging and able to true. And you can see that because there's a bug here, the code is going to crash, but it's not just going to return back to me on the command line. It basically returns an error basically where the code crashes and tells me what the exception is. And it lets me basically kind of inspect what the current state of the program is as my code has crashed. And this is like what basically saves me a lot of time in productivity space when I use something like this. So we're going to talk a bit more tomorrow about how to set up a debugger, how to get the debugger configured for Python in VS Code and what are some of the features of it. Uh, but this is kind of like one of the, one of the nice, nice things that IDEs provide uh, for you in your software development. All right, so I'm going to stop this for now. Um, uh, I'll just cover a, a couple. I'll just cover a couple last things briefly. One is that uh, on the left hand side here, you have basically a bunch of main commands. So here, this is the file explorer. I went to debug mode here. Another thing is the Git source control integration, so I can make commits directly uh, through this source control panel. I'm not going to really demo it here right now, but I will talk a lot more about Git tomorrow. So you'll probably see more of this. Um, but this is another, I guess, another feature. Again, you don't have to do the command line. You can just do it through this interface. There's a search window. Um, you can also install in extensions. Like we told you to, we instructed you to install like the Python extensions, but there's also other extensions that you can install to kind of add additional capabilities to your IDE. Um, and one of them is like the uh, Jupyter Notebook extension. So here we can you know, open up Jupyter Notebooks directly in the Py in VS Code itself. Um, so that's one way you can actually develop on Jupyter Notebooks inside of VS Code. Um, so that's the, the main things about uh, VS Code. The next thing I want to, there's some other, yeah, like some other useful features on the demo. We can discuss this more if people are interested. We can add lots of other features. Uh, the second thing we'll talk about are Jupyter Notebooks. This might be something you are familiar with um, if you use some Python in the past. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks are, are really useful for a lot of a lot of things. Um, it's a combination of basically these code cells that you can execute, and also these text-based markdown cells, markdown cells like the one you see here, where you can like write tutorials, write comments, kind of structure your your document basically. And that's really um, one of the nice things about it. It's really a document for you. Um, it's um it's nice because you can run and rerun one cell at a time, which lets you, lets you like play around with the code, try to understand how something works. Use it for plotting if you want to like adjust your y axes, your x axes, just to change some text. You only have to rerun that little block of code. Um, and yeah, like I guess it's good for solving a problem because you can like basically like think of it like a problem set problem that you're writing out the solution for, and you can write text, you can write code, and it's all like all integrated together nicely. Um, one of the uh, one of the gotchas of Jupyter Notebooks that is important to remember is that the outputs of your notebooks depends on the orders that you run and rerun your cells. So like sometimes like maybe your Jupyter Notebook only works if you run cells one, two, three, and then five, and then three again, and then four, and then five. And like, I know that's happened to me. And that's something just to be wary of when you're developing with Jupyter Notebooks. So like you could be spending this time kind of debugging and working on things, but try to make sure in the end that you can run it all the way through uh, after you like restart your notebook and make sure it runs completely. That's kind of one of the things that kind of is a gotcha for not being good at repeatability sometimes. And it's not really designed for 
programming a full software package. So like if you really want to develop a whole package that has a bunch of different files, a bunch of different functions, here you're really just having a notebook with one file open. So it's it's really a different use case than what we talked about with like VS Code and developing multiple files in a project directory and all that at the same time. Um, the last thing we want to talk about are plain text editors. You probably have heard of some of these. Um, some of them like Vim, Emacs, Notepad, uh, Nano. These are like, they basically let you type text into a document and save it. And there might be a few other features, but there's not too much more. Uh, we generally recommend against doing large amounts of programming in these, in these kinds of features because they don't have this other kind of assistance that Jupyter Notebooks or an IDE like VS Code offer, which basically, uh, it basically makes it that your code you're more likely to be prone to bugs when you're writing in something like this because you don't have that extra assistance to kind of guide you in your coding um it's kind of inevitable that you'll encounter using one of these programs at some point so we, it's probably good just to like learn how to like do a couple of simple things but like my like experience is like i don't know how to use emacs at all i've gone this far in my career i i know how to use vim a little bit i know how to like write a couple i know how to write some stuff i know how to close the close and save the file and like that's that's about it but like that's like kind of all i needed to know and i, I try to avoid doing too much stuff in them just because um i, I think it's it's it's, it's nice in the but it's you know it's written many years ago we've added a lot more features now that we think are better in kind of assisting you how to program um some of, the, some of the times that it's kind of inevitable that you end up using some of these things, like if you SSH into a remote machine and access a remote machine, you might have to like, you might be in a terminal, you don't really have a GUI, um, but there's actually a feature in VS Code that lets you actually program remotely over SSH. So you can actually use IDEs like VS Code instead of using things like Vim when you're accessing a rem remote machine. Um, yeah, so that's kind of uh, just uh, an overview of uh, the kind of development environments that you can program in. So you'll see a lot more about VS Code uh, throughout this course as we talk about it more. Uh, you can see a lot of our stuff is already in Jupyter Notebooks because you know we think it's a nice docu way to kind of document things off of tutorials. Uh, so you see a lot of that. You won't see very much uh, Vim or Emacs from now on, basically. I don't think we'll mention it for the rest of the course, but. Um, um, so that's, those are kind of your options and, you know, definitely play around with what you think is the option that works best for you and what the balance is between. You don't have to use strictly one thing for everything, you know, play around with like what, what programs or combination programs works best for you for your workflow. All right. Um, so now let's, uh, we'll continue and we'll talk about programming paradigms in particular to uh, uh, programming paradigms in particular that are, uh, quite, uh, you hear of quite often uh, when you talk about software development, and those are object-oriented and functional programming. We'll talk about what they mean, uh, uh, what their use cases are, uh, what's the difference between the two, and you'll get some practice pro programming in, in some of this to, uh, just to get, get, get a better sense for this instead of talking about it in an abstract sense. So first, we'll talk about uh, object-oriented programming. So here, let's take a brief second to uh, appreciate the meme. <laughs> yeah, so uh, object-oriented programming, as some of you might have heard this term before, uh, it's quite popular right now in astronomy. People are like, oh, my program, my package is object-oriented. Um, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, so that's, and like, why, why do people like it? So let's, we'll talk about that briefly. Um, so one of the, one of the, the key thing in object-oriented programming is that we structure our code around classes. Uh, so classes are these constructs in Python where you're able to basically encapsulate a bunch of variables and functions into a single object. And that object has all these attributes, these, these variables and functions that you can run. So for example, I could create a telescope class to kind of like control a telescope. And in that telescope class, I can have a function like close shutter, which if I run closes the shutter of the telescope. I can also have fields like uh, telescope that current target is basically tells me what the current target that telescope is pointed to. Instead of keeping all this as separate variables that you need to keep track of in your code, it's all underneath this telescope object. So you can easily just access everything you need to know about this telescope inside this telescope object. Um, it's very useful for tracking the state of things. Uh, so like telescope that current target changes every time we salute to a different target and we change targets. Um, this is useful because many things in the world, many things in the world that we want to model in programming have some sort of state, and we want to basically we we use these objects to kind of keep track of that state, and as that state changes, we update that state basically. Um, 
Another uh, feature of classes, a more advanced feature, is this uh, concept of inheritance. So basically, you can take functions and fields from a parent class or super class. And this is useful for basically reorganizing or reusing code. You don't have to copy code multiple times. For example, if I wanted to write a, a, a separate class as a space telescope class, this is a more specialized class. It's just used to control space telescopes. Let's pretend we can control space telescopes. Um, the space telescope class probably, you know, we want to have the same features of the regular telescope class, like closing the shutter and switching targets and keeping track of what the current target is. Um, but we might also have want to have other specific functionality for a space telescope, like distance to Earth, which most of our regular telescopes we don't really care about. But for a space telescope, we want to know how far it is from Earth. Um, so here we can use this. Uh, we can build a space telescope class that basically inherits all these uh, functions and attributes of its parent class without having to rewrite that code, but also add additional functionality that's specialized just for the space telescope class. So that's one of the, one of the benefits of algebraic programming is that it allows you to structure your code in this way to basically build build this uh, build these models that you want to basically represent the state of the thing that you want to represent, and it basically allows you to organize things in a way that's kind of neat. Um, so uh, I think it's it's easy to, to talk about things in these abstract senses, but it's really the best way to get to know how to do object-oriented programming is to do it. So we're gonna basically, for our first activity, build a free fall gravity simulator. Um, so we have, um, we, uh, so we basically use simulation to determine how long it takes for a particle to fall from a, uh, fall to the ground from a height of 10 meters. And basically, we'll pull everyone in the end to see what they get. Um, we've already written a bunch of a code st structured like scaffolding for you. So basically, you only have to kind of understand what's going on and try to implement um, the missing parts of this code. So I'll just go over briefly uh, what all this code is doing right now, just to get everyone kind of oriented. So we have um, this particle class. It's currently not doing anything. This is part of your bo uh, bonus activity if you get to it. Um, the main part is that we have this free fall particle class. And the goal of this free fall particle class is to simulate a particle falling due to Earth's gravity. Um, this free fall particle class gets initialized with this init function. So anytime you create a new free fall particle, this init function gets run. And the first variable that gets passed is the self variable. This is uh, basically used anytime you have a function that belongs to a class. The first uh, variable is always that the first argument that you pass into a function is always the self function basically allows it to refer to itself. It access all the other attributes and functions that this variable has. And this basically tells Python that this is a dynamic function that is uh, basically belongs to this object. And the second variable, uh, which is explicit, is the height. So we're initializing with the height that it's dropping from. And uh, you can see that uh, this, uh, this init function is pretty simple. We always call a super dot init. So this initiates, initiates its parent class. This parent class is currently empty, it doesn't really do anything. So this function today is basically doesn't do anything right now. Um, but we also do things, we also do do things in this in the initialization function. We set the height, uh, its, its height attribute equal to the height that gets passed in. We set the velocity equal to zero because if we start out this free fall particle at rest, um, we set the time to zero because the time, the simulation starts at t equals zero, the time hasn't elapsed yet. Uh, we set this variable dt, which is the time step of our simulation, equal to the default dt, which is set to 0 0.1 seconds. Um, you can change that if you want, um, feel free to. And then we set the gravity in our simulation to negative 9.8 meters per second squared, which is the gravity of Earth. And basically, once you implement this, you can and run this block of code, um, you can create an object. So, oops, I have the entire answer key here. Let me just refresh this notebook. I was testing it works, so I uh, see the memes. Get the function. Okay, great. This is the not. This is the running this notebook was not authorized by Google. It's okay. All right. Now, now, now you have the one without the answers. Okay. Pretend you didn't see that. Um. So now that we've created this init function, we can create free fall particle objects. So we can create our object with just calling free fall particle. And we set the first argument equal to 10. That's the height that we want to drop uh, from the free fall particle from in meters. 
remember that there was actually a self variable in front of it. Uh, this is implicit, uh, like I said, so this is required, but it's implicit in the call, so you know you don't have to keep passing it in every time someone calls this function, but it is uh, it is uh, declared anytime you create a function. So even though the self here is the first argument, it's an implicit argument, so you don't see it uh, uh, declared here when we actually call the uh, free fall particle class. So after we create um, this object, we can look at the, its attributes, time and height. And if I do that, you can see that uh, the time is zero because the simulation hasn't progressed yet. And the height is 10 meters, which is the uh, meters that we passed into as the initialization for the object. Um, this function, this class can also have uh, other helper functions like get num steps run. This is a just a helper function that returns the number of time steps that have run by comparing self.time with self.dt. So these are kind of like, uh, you, you can see that this function actually requires no other input. It basically takes attributes that it already has and it basically returns something based on the current attributes. Um, so you can, you know, you can go here and run that. So. Yeah. Uh, where'd you go? I can't program without helpers. Yeah, there we go. So here you can see that it prints out zero because no time has elapsed, so no steps of the simulation has run. Uh, but this is uh, something that can be run without any uh, additional input. It just only depends on the current state of this ball object. Um, so what we want to have you work on um, is to you know use object-oriented programming and program this next function called simulate time step. Uh, this uh, function will advance the particle's height by one step at a time. So basically, time will go from zero to 0 0.1 seconds. The particle is going to drop a bit. Its velocity is going to increase as it's dropping. And basically, uh, we've included if you uh, we've included some pseudocode because I I know we didn't we didn't ask everyone to prepare their physics classes to uh, to to work on Code Astro. So we included some pseudocode below for how do you advance uh, a particle's height and velocity given a constant acceleration here. Um, basically, I want you to implement this function and this will advance the simulation by one time step and then uh, run this function multiple times and see how many, uh, how long it takes for the particle to go from a height of 10 meters to a height of zero meters and uh, you know, use the attributes, update the attributes and things like that. Um, so we have some instructions up here. You can read them a little bit more closely. Um, so yes, your goal is to implement this free fall simulator, calculate how long it takes for a particle to fall from a height of 10 meters. Uh, there's a, if you have time, there's a bonus activity that we want to basically, uh, you know, write other particle class in the future, add like three dimensionality, add other forces, uh, like basically think about if, if we want to reuse some code, what kind of stuff will go into the particle super class and what are the stuff that we all written uh, and it should be specific to the free fall particle subclass. Um, so we have a, piazza, a post on Piazza um, where I've asked how long it takes for a particle to fall from a height of 10 meters. If you wanna, every, we want at the end, each group to kind of post their answer for how long it took in their simulation. Just post it in here um, and we'll collect all the responses. Uh, like Sarah mentioned, uh, for these kind of roles, we'll have, we have two kind of roles. One is the driver, the person that's actually kind of sharing their screen or typing the code for this activity. And then the other one's the navigator who's kind of uh, looking behind them over their shoulder and trying to uh, guide them for like where, where this code should be going and kind of help pick out bugs or like um, making, making sure that they know what they're typing and checking over things. Um, so you have the, we have some more detailed instructions here, which is kind of repeating what I just mentioned above. Um, um, breakout, uh, so for people on Zoom, breakout into your breakout groups based on your group numbers. For people in the room, uh, we'll try to find your group members here. So I know this will take maybe a few minutes. Um, we have uh, we have uh, we have this room here. We also have a, a second room, a smaller room in the back that if it's like it's too loud here, feel free to file over there. Um, so this uh, we're planning should take about 25 minutes, let's say in total, just do, this is the first activity. You wanna make sure everyone gets set up. Uh, make sure people have plenty of time. So let's, uh, we'll try to reconvene at 50 minutes past the hour. So that's 10.50 Pacific time. So you have 25 minutes to work on this and we'll go around and make sure everyone's set up properly. Sound good? Cool. Okay. Okay, um, just brief announcement that we posted the uh, answer key for the code developing uh, Co-developing, uh, what's it called? Jupyter Notebook. 
Uh, so feel free to take a look at that. Uh, so for the next 25 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, two additional notebooks, one on NumPy and Pandas and one on Matplotlib and AstroPy. Uh, there are a bunch of activities uh, in each of these notebooks as well, uh, which we probably won't have time for before the end of the synchronous session today. Um, so we'll leave those for uh, like work during the um, uh, during the afternoon or whenever you're planning to work on this. Um, okay, so why are we focusing on this? Um, we've chosen these four Python packages because we think that they're pretty fundamental to software development in astronomy. Um, I'm not going to try and teach you how to use these from the ground up. Um, in order to, so most of you uh, did the uh, diagnostic assignment in which we, uh, you showed to us that you have some basic knowledge of, not basic, you have some, some uh, foundational knowledge of NumPy in particular. Um, so a lot of this stuff will be a little bit familiar if not like, you know, if not you're, if you're not, even if you're not a complete expert on it. Um, I'm going to focus on, in particular, the difference between NumPy arrays and lists in this first part, and then I'm going to talk to you about the uh, fundamental objects that make up pandas. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about uh, the importance of state, which Jason touched on a little bit in Matplotlib, and then we'll talk about the importance of not reinventing the wheel with AstroPy. Um, so focusing just generally on the philosophies of these packages and best practices for how to use them rather than like sort of a tutorial on like how to use them from the ground up. Okay, so let's start with NumPy. Uh, so the foundational uh, data type in NumPy is arrays. Uh, so you have probably seen or heard of NumPy arrays before, as well as Python lists. Um, in some ways they're similar and in some ways they're different. So both are used for storing data and objects. Both are immutable, meaning you can change their elements. So if you create an array, you can modify the first element. Um, you can extract both. You can extract items from both of them with indexing and slicing, which I'll get to in a sec. And you can also iterate over both of them. So that's like putting them in a for loop. Um, but there are a couple of key things between arrays and lists that are different. Um, first, operators act on the elements of an array instead of the array as a whole. Um, arrays can only hold data of a single type. Arrays can efficiently store large amounts of data in memory, and arrays are of fixed size in memory, whereas lists don't have a fixed size. So the question here I listed is, if arrays have a fixed size, how do you think numpy.append works? So um, when you create an array, it just sets aside a block of memory, and it's you, you can never uh, add more memory to it. Um, so numpy append actually works by creating an entirely new array um, in memory and then copying over the first part of your array and then filling in the new part that you want to append to it. Um, so because of that, numpy append isn't always the most efficient uh, way of doing things in terms of memory management. Okay, so let's talk about what some of these things actually do. Um, so we'll create some Oh, I should have said too, I'm working in VS Code. Um, so now I'm running, you can also run these as in collaboratory, um, but I'm running them in VS Code. Uh, so I'm going to create some lists and some sample arrays. Um, I'm working on a Mac. I just did shift enter and that runs this all. Okay, so let's check out some of the different behaviors between lists and arrays. So first I'm going to multiply X list by four. Then I'm going to multiply the array X by four and then divide both of them. So you can see that multiplying the list by four just copied the whole list four times. It appended uh, the list to itself four times over. Multiplying the array by four multiplies each individual element. And the same thing with dividing. Um, and then dividing doesn't even work for lists in general. It's an unsupported operand type. Okay, let's talk about iterating, indexing, and slicing. So iterating over an array looks just like iterating over a list. So if we iterate uh, or print out the value of um, each element in the list and each element of the array, we get the same answer. And I'll print out each one at a time. If you have an n-dimensional array, iterating over it um, will iterate over slices in the first dimension. 
So here what I'm doing is I'm creating a, a five by five array. So let's first just print out what that looks like so you can see. So this is the random numbers were uh, created and populated in this five by five array. So if I iterate over this, I'll take out this print statement. This is what it looks like. So first it prints out the first slice of that array, then the next slice, etc. So you could also accomplish the same thing um, by iterating over um, each, iterating over the array like this. So actually explicitly slicing the array and then printing out just value to get the same answer. You can also select subsets of the array using what are called conditionals. Um, so a conditional is um, a statement that evaluates to true or false. So effectively what's going on under the hood here is this creates a binary mask, meaning that um, it's just an array of trues or falses. And all of the elements that, are, that have true indexes, indices um, remain, and all of those that have false don't. Um, so if we do this, now there's only, uh, we're, we're indexing only a subset. So just to give you context, here's what X looks like. And then here's the uh, subset that's been indexed using the conditional. Um, so another important thing to keep in mind about arrays is that in general setting an array equal doesn't create a new array. Um, so if you edit either array, it'll still modify the other one. So let's try that out. If we attempt to create a new array by saying z equals x, and then we modify x, z is also modified. So you can see that we only modified, let's, uh, let's first print out, this might not work actually because we're in, I'm not gonna try to do that. <laughs> but yeah, so this element was modified in z as well. If you really need a new copy of the array, you can use the x.copy, which creates a new array in memory and then copies over each individual element. Um, the last little thing I want to tell you about is hstack and vstack, which are useful to stitch multiple arrays together. Um, so let me sh remind you what x and z look like, and then I'll show you what the output of hstack looks like. So here's X, here's Z, and then here's H stack. So it's like a horizontal stacking of the two arrays. Now let's try stacking them vertically. So you can see Z stack or vertical stack creates, uh, adds another dimension to the array. So now um, this is uh, two slices of an array stacked on top of each other. Um, don't worry if that all went by really fast. You'll have chance. You'll have a chance in the afternoon to go through it in more detail by yourself and read through all of the comments. Uh, all right, let's go on to pandas. Uh, so pandas shows up all over astronomy. Um, it's a really useful way of storing large data sets of different types. So say you have some float data and some integer data and some string data. Um, pandas is a nice way that you can uh, put that all together and also label your data. Um, the most basic unit in the pandas uh, in the pandas ecosystem are the series and data frame objects. Uh, so you can create a series object uh, by just passing in. In this case, we're passing in a list. Um, so let's see what this looks like. So you can see the series, each element of the series is labeled uh, with an integer label called the index. Um, and then the data is here as well. Um, the next uh, fundamental data type in pandas is a data frame, which is constructed of several different series. So you can construct a data frame by passing in an individual series. So here S is our series. We're going to pass in S into this data frame. And then let's see what that looks like. So uh, Jupyter Notebooks have a nice way of formatting data frames. So the only difference here is that we also have a column label sample. Um, 
We can also add some more columns to our data frame. So series is just one column and a data frame can consist of several columns. You can notice here that when we add columns to a data frame, uh, we, can, we can do it by performing like array, array type operations on the, uh, the existing series. So here we're taking the elements in sample and integer dividing them by one. Here we're taking the elements and adding one, and then here we're squaring the elements. So that's what that looks like. So uh, uh, here's the integer division, here's adding one, here's the sample squared. So now we've got this nice data frame. Another really nice thing about Pandas data frames is that you can read and write them um, relatively easily. Uh, so to write a CSV to disk, you just use this method to disk, sorry, to CSV. And then to read back, use pd.readcsv. Uh, pandas read CSV is probably the, the method that I use most often for reading CSV files. Let's see what that does. So now I, this uh, file here, demo, was created. I brought a nice CSV of my existing data frame. And then I read it back, and now this DF uh, contains that data as well. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about these guys. Uh, there's a bunch of activities at the bottom that you can go through later. But with the time left, let's go on to map what we're going to ask Okay. All right. So if you're running this um, this notebook in Colab, you'll have to run this cell at the top to install Orbitize, because we'll actually use Orbitize in this tutorial. Um, but if you're running it in uh, VS Code, you should already have Orbitize in your environment, so you don't need to run it. Okay. So uh, I alluded before to Matplotlib relying on the concept of changing state. Um, so the state of a programming environment is just something that controls the behavior of the environment. So if you just open up an IPython term terminal and you type import orbitize, you're going to get an error. It's going to be an import error. Um, that's, uh, but if you, sorry, what am I talking about? <laughs> if, you do, if you do that, you'll be fine. Um, if you, sorry, if you just open up a terminal and you type orbitize.plot.orbitplot, you'll get an import error because you haven't loaded Orbitize into your environment. Um, however, if you type import Orbitize, then this orbitize.plot.orbitplot command, um, you've modified the state of your environment and this code now runs. So Jason talked in the functional and object-oriented section about um, object-oriented paradigm, meaning that the outputs depend on the current state of your function. Uh, this current state of your environment. Um, so matplotlib is a tribute to that. Matplotlib very explicitly and in a lot of ways depends on the current state of your environment. Um, that's how matplotlib knows to do things like automatically uh, create font sizes that are standard across all of your plots, for example. Um, so in order to <clears throat> in order to drive this home, this uh, idea of not quite lib relying on your current state of your environment. Uh, we're going to use uh, a parameter called matplotlib.rcprams, which is a way that you can uh, modify the state of your environment um, in order to change the behavior of your code. Um, so let's start by making a figure. I'll import matplotlib. I'm going to make a plot here. So I'll create a figure. I'm going to add a title to the figure. Um, add some X labels and Y labels. Now I'm going to update this RC params object. So I'm going to modify the state of my environment. Now I'm making the font size equal to 22. So notice that this command doesn't have any output. It's only going to affect the state of your environment. But now when I make a new figure, um, the font size will be different. Uh, there's one catch, which is when I added the Y label to this particular plot, I passed in a font size. So I passed in a font size of 10. So let's see what this does. Okay. 
So remember first I made something with the default font size and that looks like this. Then I updated the state of the environment so that the default font size is now 22. So now everything's big, but I passed in a font size of 10 for the Y label. So the Y label ended up being smaller. So you can see, you can sort of see by running this example, uh, the, um, the order that matplotlib checks things um, in order to output your uh, the font size. So it'll first uh, check if any font size ramp, font size arguments were passed into your Y label or title commands. Then it will check the default state of the environment through the RC params. So uh, when we talked about pandas, we talked about uh, series and uh, data frames, which are the two sort of basic units or fundamental objects of pandas. Um, the analogous unit in matplotlib is a figure object, uh, which is sort of a container for all of the other plot elements. Uh, if you've used matplotlib before, you've probably seen um, and played with and been frustrated by figure objects. So let's take a look at what the figure object actually is. Um, so first we'll start by creating some data that we want to plot. Um, then I'll initialize a figure object here. And then I'll, uh, I'll plot some, I'll plot these data as an error bar. So notice that I didn't pass in this figure object anywhere. I just said plt.error bar. So plt is matplotlib, um, dot pyplot. So the way that PLT knows which figure to plot this on is because of the current state of the environment. Um, so currently, PLT points to this figure that was current, that was recently created. Um, if I also print out the type of the figure object, um, I get matplotlib.figure.figure. So let's run this again. So that's what we get. Um, so whenever you initialize a new figure object, the current figure or the state of the object is updated. So like I said, that's how plt.plot or plt.errorbar knows where to put your data. Um, but the sort of rules of succession work in the same way as we explored above with the font size, in that if you pass in a figure object, it'll override the default state of the environment. Um, so let's take a look at how we might use that to make nice figures. Um, so we'll look at another way to initialize a new figure object using the plt.subplots command. Uh, the subplots command is what I probably use most often to make multi-panel figures. Um, so we, the, this command plt.subplots now returns two different objects, a figure object and this axe object. So I haven't told you what axe is yet. Um, axe is actually a, a list. Oh, no, 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 sorry. It's an, it's an array of axes objects. So if we print out the type of this fig, axe, and then the zeroth element of axe, this is what it looks like. Oops, so fig is type mapplotlib.figure.figure. Ax is a numpy array, and then ax0 is this axes.subplot.axes subplot. Usually I'll just call that an axis object for short. Um, so we can modify uh, each of these axes objects by um, accessing them. So ax0 uh, points to this particular axes object in the figure, ax1 points to this. So you can see that we can set different uh, behaviors of these by accessing them. Um, this also tells matplotlib, you know, if I were to just say plt.plot, that would look in the current state of the environment. So it would look for whatever axis is currently set to be the default axis. But if instead I say ax0, it's a, I'm overriding that default. I'm saying, look at this particular axis and plot in there. So I've been talking about axes objects. What actually are those? Those are um, 
the uh, the sort of next thing down in the hierarchy in Matplotlib object land. <laughs> Um, so these objects are containers for all the plot elements in a particular figure object. Um, so uh, the hierarchy goes that you have, you might have one figure object that has several different axes objects. So those are attributes, or they belong to the figure object. So rather than using, uh, I can also access ax <laughs> I can also access these axes objects. Um, through fig.axes. So just to review here, when I initialized this using plt.subplots, it returned this fig and this ax. Um, so this is a list of axes objects. This is the actual figure object. But I can also access these axes objects through this figure object, their, their uh, attributes. So I do that using this, so fig.axes0. So this is points to the same object as ax0. And I can set the x limits there. So that works the same way. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip these uh, GCA and SCA. You can go over those when you're, um, when you're working through this by yourself. But they're just another way of resetting the state and telling Matplotlib which axis object to point to. So I wanted to finish the matplotlib section with some general tips. Um, first is not to over-engineer your plotting code. And what I mean by this is that it's good to return the figure and axis objects to the user so that the user can make modifications to their plotting code by themselves. Um, you don't want to necessarily make your code able to make any type of plot under the sun. Um, you just want to make it make pretty good sort of first draft plots that users can then modify to their own specific needs. Um, also, make sure you apply principles of good design. Um, this means using large font sizes, using color palettes with lots of contrast, um, making sure your plots are colorblind friendly. Um, it's also good to make sure you can differentiate plot elements in more than one way. So for example, Rather than just making different lines with different colors, you could make one a, a certain color and dashed, another a different color and solid. Okay, and we'll come back to these activities. Sweet. So um, last but not least, I want to give you a quick introduction to AstroPy. And uh, the reason we're, I think AstroPy it, it doesn't have as, um, there's not necessarily like an underlying driving philosophy that we're trying to get here. Whereas like in NumPy, we wanted to emphasize the difference between, uh, in Num when, we're, when I was talking about NumPy, we wanted to emphasize the difference between arrays and lists. Pandas, we wanted to emphasize uh, the foundational types of series and data frames. In Matplotlib, I wanted to emphasize the importance of the changing state. AstroPy, there's not necessarily a core thing that I'm trying to get at because AstroPy is so broad and contains so much amazing code. So the main point I want to drive home here is just that if you're trying to do a common astronomy task, it probably already exists in AstroPy. <laughs> um, so don't reinvent the wheel with your code. If you can rely on something that's already in AstroPy, definitely just use that. <laughs> um, so to give you sort of a taste of some of the things that AstroPy can do, um, I've included three examples of um, some libraries that are really helpful in AstroPy. One that Jason talked about already is AstroPy.constants and AstroPy.units. Um, so to give an example, let's uh, calculate the velocity, the orbital velocity of the Earth. Um, so I import constants. I can just write in constant dot g, the gravitational constant, the mass of the sun, and then divide by an au. And then I have the speed of the Earth. So 
If you're curious, the speed of the Earth is 115200885541 meters to the three halves divided by AU to the one halves divided by seconds. Very intense, very uh, intuitive units. <laughs> so those units aren't super helpful, but luckily AstroPi has capabilities to convert units for you. So if you uh, have heard the good word about CGS units, um, you can just <laughs> Um, you can convert to CGS by just typing .cgs. You can also use this to method to convert to any AstroPi unit uh, combination that you want. So let's see what this does. For its orbital velocity in CGS, or centimeters per second in this case, it's here. And then you can also convert it to kilometers per second here. So this um, units and constants is in AstroPi is really helpful for error checking and bug handling. Um, if you, uh, especially with calculations, um, in general in physics, it's always good to make sure that your units line up and AstroPy makes it convenient so that you can do it just from within your code. So definitely use that. Um, let's do another example with, uh, with time. Um, so AstroPy has this really nice time library that allows you to convert between all of the different thousand time conventions that astronomers use. So as an example, I'll create a time object um, with my birthday in uh, this particular format, ISO, and then I can convert it to any other, uh, to many other different time standards. So if I want to put it in a decimal year, the JD to MJD, um, it just does it automatically. I do all my time conversions in AstroPy <laughs> um, for even for not astronomy related things. <laughs> it's very, very powerful. You can also convert coordinate systems uh, with AstroPy. Uh, so if you want to put in a sky coordinate in uh, RA and DEC and then convert it to galactic coordinates, it can do that for you automatically. And then AstroPy also has really nice capability to read in its files and access their contents. Uh, I'm going to leave this for you to go over um, on your own time as well. Um, but I think this is in particular, I think this AstroPy fits reader is a really, really powerful part of AstroPy um, and definitely not enough astronomers know how to use this. Um, actually didn't have BS9 installed on my computer for a long time <laughs> because I always used AstroPy fits reader. Um, all right, so about eight minutes early, I think I will just let, I think we'll just let everyone go a little bit early. Uh, did we have, Jason, did, uh, we did you want people to ask questions on Piazza? To, uh, yeah, let's do uh, Piazza questions. Um, yeah. So we just want to get everyone in the hang of using Piazza to think about questions and things like that. So I think Sarah, you're pointing it up right now, but everyone wants to take like five minutes, think of something today that was unclear or something you, you're wondering about, go on Piazza and you can ask us a question and uh, one of us will try to answer your question to the best extent we can. Do yes, you have a question? Do we do that by making a new post? Yeah, make a new post on Piazza. Yeah, it can be anonymous. You can put your name on it. You don't have to put your name on it. It's something you're wondering, something that was confusing today. Uh, just we want to get people in the habit of using Piazza as a, as a tool to, to ask questions. It's nice because once you post on there, everyone else can read your question too. You can be anonymous if you don't want to be identified, but then other people that might be wondering the same thing can also see the same answer. So uh, Sarah, do you want to... I guess everyone should have access to Piazza. I don't know, should we demonstrate uh, how to do that? Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you go to Piazza and um, click this new post. Um, I think you have a question or a note. I think mine might look a little different because I'm an instructor. Um, type, type, type. Type, type, type. Um, you can select folders if you want to, if today is relevant to day one. Um, you can also, there's an option to make anonymous somewhere. I don't know, it might not show for me. May not let us. Because we're instructors. Yeah, but there is an anonymous option, and then just post your question. Okay. 
So yeah, even if you Thank don't you. have a question right now, think of one and post it on Piazza. It goes for everyone. Okay, uh, otherwise I think we're good to wrap up. I'll, I'll, I'll give the in-person people a, a, a brief reminder on logistics, but otherwise we, we can do that after we close the Zoom. Cool, thanks for coming to the first day, everyone. Um, yes. Have a great uh, rest of your first day of working on your projects and finishing up all the in-person activities. And we will be on Piazza and Discord, et cetera, ready to answer your questions. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Thanks, all.